Our discussion of marginalized voices in the 19th century turns now to slavery. Slavery has not been absent from our course. It has really woven through since the very first explorations that we did of European colonizers and conquerors coming to the lands of North America and settling the lands that are going to be recognized by the United States or um, part, incorporated as part of the ongoing narrative of the history of the United States. Um, but we haven't yet explored the voices of enslaved people at this time. Part of the problem with that, of course, is that the voices of enslaved people at this time were largely silenced. Um, in a strange way, such as it is to be giving a close examination of slavery uh, toward the end of our course, it's sadly fitting in a number of ways because the rise of giving voice to enslaved black Americans is something that happens relatively late in the time that our course is covering. The rise of the genre that really predominates uh, this uh, uh, enfranchising of the voices of enslaved Americans, the slave narrative, is a genre that really finds its place in American literature in the 1840s, 1850s, and the very early part of the 1860s. Although, as we'll see, um, it's not in the 1840s that the genre itself is becoming invented. The genre had existed long before that, but in American literature, the rise of the narrative that captured the life of an enslaved person, written from the perspective of somebody who had been enslaved, is a later development in American literature and correlates with the rise of abolitionism and a resistance to slavery that's going to reach its apex in the 1850s and will lead to the U.S. Civil War in the early 1860s. We're going to take a look at three examples of the slave narrative in this lecture, and then in the lecture that follows, we will devote considerable attention to what most people believe is the masterpiece of the genre, and what I would argue is one of the you know, 10 most important books of American history that every single uh, American should read and be familiar with. That's the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Um, but in this lecture, we're gonna take a look at three slave narratives. Uh, by Olauda Equiano, Harriet Jacobs, and William Wells Brown. I, the assigned readings for this discussion are excerpts of each of those narratives. And the reason that I assigned excerpts of those narratives is we read a complete narrative with Douglass's uh, uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, but I wanted you to get a sense of different voices of people who had been enslaved and found their way out of slavery and were able then to write about their experiences. And each of the excerpts that I assigned for this discussion cover a different aspect of slavery. So the excerpt from Equiano's text uh, primarily focuses on the process of uh, becoming kidnapped and forced into slavery and the horrifying journey through the Middle Passage. That is uh, the passage that runs from the coast of Africa across the Atlantic Ocean into the Caribbean or into mainland America. I also asked you to take a look at uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl from Harriet Jacobs, which gives you a perspective of what day-to-day -day life uh, is like for somebody who is enslaved. And Jacob's uh, perspective in particular is unique because hers is the best known of the narratives written from the perspective of a woman who is enslaved. Uh, notice the rest of the individuals in our uh, slave narrative unit are written by men. 
And then the excerpt from Brown gives you a sense of escaping from slavery uh, and the process that Brown goes through and then coming out on the other side, how he is able to establish an identity for himself. Each one of those movements, I think, is a vital representation of what it meant to be enslaved in uh, North America as a black person. And then we'll take a look at a more holistic version of the narrative when we turn to Douglas. So let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of the slave narrative, how it functions as a work of literature, and what you might want to be looking for as you are in the process of reading examples of slave narratives. So the, the, probably the key word here that we're going to want to talk about is the concept of the autobiography. The autobiography as a literary genre uh, is typically written by an individual that purports to depict events from his or her life and is infused with reflection and introspection. Autobiography is different from, let's say, a journal or different from a memoir in the sense that there's a focus on the events that are happening in an individual's life, their personal reflection on those events, and the goal is for a public audience to consume uh, the information from the autobiography. A slave narrative is a specific type of, of, of autobiography, and it includes, or there are certain tropes that are um, built into the genre. So let's talk about what some of those are and what we might want to be looking for in our discussion of uh, the slave narrative. So the slave narrative is a, um, it's an autobiographical account, and importantly here, it's written by someone who was enslaved, and subsequently escaped slavery. Maybe there's an escape as an, an actual becoming a fugitive from slavery, uh, you know, running out uh, away from uh, the plantation complex where the individual is being enslaved or the home where the individual is being enslaved. Um, but the, the idea here is it captures the events in slavery. A key aspect of the genre is that the individual is recounting what happened to them while they are enslaved. The, the focus here then is generally on the hardships of slavery. It's generally reflected on the cruelties of slavery and the hypocrisy of slavery as well, right? What is contributing to uh, the experience of being an enslaved person, dealing with people who are enslaving you, and seeing the hypocrisy um, that often accompanies, you know, for instance, uh, as somebody who's in the process of enslaving but consider this themselves to be a good Christian person. There's a, a focus often on the abuse and the suffering that come along with slavery. And often that means slave narratives can be difficult to read, particularly if you have a finely attuned sense of empathy and you find yourself really connecting with the characters because what is, often, what is being depicted in slave narratives are cruelties and abuses and suffering that is difficult, I think, for the human mind to fully conceptualize. The burden becomes on to the writer to use figurative language and imagery in such a way that brings the cruelties of slavery to life for an audience that is not familiar with what it is like to be enslaved. There are typically um, uh, education and learning play central roles in the slave narrative. The development of someone's uh, education uh, as uh, an enslaved person, uh, realizing what is the possibilities outside uh, of slavery and in the world, um, and also the prospect of uh, becoming more aware of uh, 
uh, the possibilities that life itself is going to have and how limiting, uh, supremely, cruelly limiting the institution of slavery is to the human condition. Many uh, such slave narratives deal as well with Christianity. The values of Christianity, and as I already mentioned, the hypocrisy of Christian enslavers. So it's an exploration of what it really means to be a Christian at this time, and an argument that those who are participating in the institution of slavery lack the requisite characteristics that, to be considered a good Christian. So we have an exploration here of religious studies, you know, filtered through history, filtered through the experiences of being an enslaved person. These texts then should really be considered didactic texts. A didactic text is a text that is designed to educate. It's designed to teach the reader or convince the reader of a particular something. So we have teaching, we have educating, we have argument and persuasion that are all built in as part of a didactic text. And that makes the inclusion of learning and education as genre characteristics really interesting here. Because as the individual in the text is learning, well, is, is developing an appreciation for learning and education as a way to lift themselves out of the horrible situation that they have found themselves in, the text itself is also engaging in an act of trying to teach, educate, and persuade readers to lift the nation out of the cruel suffering that it has found itself in. There is some debate among some scholars about how much we should understand slave narratives to be chiefly autobiographical and how much authorial creativity might be involved in the construction of slave narratives. And this is a tricky debate that we find ourselves in because nobody is going to be able to write a narrative of their life that is absolutely to the letter, 100% accurate, as if a camera had been on them the entire time, right? Even our own perception of what is real and our own perception of history is filtered through our memory, is filtered through ideology, is filtered through our personal experience. And the way that we perceive something being in a, in, a, in a moment is sometimes different than the way someone else in that very same moment is perceiving it, right? In other words, uh, one of these narratives written from the perspective of the person who's doing the enslaving is going to read very differently. And now the question is, which one of those is quote unquote real? Which one of those is quote unquote true? It's, it's a challenge, right? Because depends on what the audience perceives as real. And of course, we can't deny that each person's experience in that moment is real. It's real to them, but of course it's written through their point of view and through their perspective. But generally, when scholars are talking about the question of how much of the narrative has to do with um, chief, being chiefly autobiographical and chiefly having a, a layer of authorial creativity, what they're talking about is, are the events depicted in exact chronological order? Might the author of the narrative have combined characters to make, a, to, to make the literary story function a little better? Might the order of events be told in a different way in order to build toward a certain narrative conclusion? Um, what is the... Um, the, the extent to which the dialogue captures the spirit of what was said, if not what was actually said at that moment. But one of the, uh, um, the concerns here is that while we recognize that these narratives are all rooted in reality, literary scholars who are looking at these as examples sometimes wonder um, what exactly might be uh, uh, used and manipulated in a literary sense to achieve a certain effect. 
I don't mean to suggest, and this is something that we also have to recognize at this moment, I don't mean to suggest that any events that are within the narratives are made up. Uh, we know that that's not the case because uh, by putting out the narrative as they do, uh, they often run the risk of uh, being uh, uh, drawing scrutiny from an audience that's trying to say that what happened in the narrative was simply fake. And at the same time that we see a rise in the slave narrative as a genre, we also see a rise in criticisms of the slave narrative. So at the same time that the slave narrative is becoming a popular genre in the North, read and circulated and discussed among people who were sympathetic to the abolitionist cause or were staunch abolitionists themselves. There are also Southern writers at this time who are trying to take apart these narratives to show that they're lies, to show that they don't capture what the, um, the many writers in the South believed were the, the actual reality of slavery. But of course, there are ideological and political and social and economic reasons that they're trying to discount the voices of enslaved people, you know, namely so that they can continue to perpetuate a system of enslaving human beings. The examples that I've asked you to read are among the most famous of uh, the slave narratives that were published in the United States or published in London and about experiences that had to do with the United States. And so uh, what is not a concern to me is um, looking at, because I'm not a historian, I'm not trying to take apart these narratives to say, did this event happen on this particular day or is it just like a ballpark? Is it, you know, how close are approximations, so on and so forth. I'm concerned about the literary effects of these genres and what these uh, texts are trying to do as literature to achieve their didactic ends. So with that said, let's turn to uh, the text, uh, the excerpts assigned for um, Equiano. This is in the volume A of the Norton Anthology of American Literature. Um, and uh, I ask you to take a look at the chapter uh, two of Equiano's narrative. And this is the uh, chapter that reflects on systems of slavery that were used in Africa and contrasting that system of slavery to the system of chattel slavery that was used in the Americas and also Equiano's literary interpretation of what life was like on the Middle Passage, crossing the Atlantic to get to the United States. Equiano, like many of the writers from this unit, were not entirely certain the exact year of Equiano's birth. Um, it's thought to be maybe around 1745. Uh, these are writers, we have a clear sense of when their deaths happen, but we don't have a clear sense of when their births happened because their births were often not recorded um, in the same way that white writers were having their um, birth years uh, remembered and honored and recognized, right, as part of the humanization of, of their, their lives. Enslaved people were having a dehumanization um, and denying the relevance of things like how old they were and what uh, year they were born. Interesting life of the life of the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano or Gustavus Bathasus, the African. It's published in London in 1789. It's reprinted in New York two years later. It goes through multiple editions and multiple reprintings. Uh, Equiano is arguably the most important black writer and black voice in an era before Frederick Douglass. Uh, he, in his text, because this is of the time of the Enlightenment, he's trying to incorporate the ideals of the Enlightenment into an anti-slavery message, uh, particularly the belief that there's a, there's a sentiment that links all of us as humans and provides for a common basis of human rights. Equiano is born in what is now the nation of Nigeria in Africa. Uh, he sold to British enslavers in 1756. So that's a, around the age of 11, we're not entirely sure. 
uh, and is then transported first to the Barbados in the Caribbean uh, and then to a plantation in Virginia. Uh, he was able to purchase his uh, emancipation, his freedom uh, in the 1760s. He left America and went to London and never returned to America. Uh, he lectured widely on the abolition of slavery and he was a proponent that was urging a project that would help resettle uh, black people into Africa, uh, what becomes known in the United States in the antebellum period as the, the, the um, colonization project, uh, which we'll get to uh, in some of the context documents that you have um, on the topic of slavery and resistance to slavery. Um, what I want to draw attention to with Equiano's narrative first is the way in which the text functions to contrast the institution of slavery or incidents of slavery in Africa with the system of chattel slavery in the United States. And this is an important um, distinction to make. And it's often a point of contention among people who, who are studying American slavery, um, people may be quick to point out something like, well, the United States was not the only nation that engaged in slavery. Uh, the ancient Greeks engaged in slavery. The uh, ancient Romans engaged in slavery. Uh, various areas of Mesopotamia and the Levant and Egypt and uh, so on and so forth, engaged in slavery. But part of what made the system of slavery unique in the United States is that it is a form of chattel slavery, of perpetual slavery, of uh, being born into slavery, of ex you know continuing a life, uh, an entire life within slavery, not having the opportunity to uh, have ever had a chance for freedom uh, and living and dying one's entire life in slavery and knowing that your children will be born uh, as enslaved people of the individuals who are claiming ownership of your body and the lives of your children. So part of what's happening in the early part of this chapter is Equiano uh, trying to create a system uh, of outlining how slavery is different in Africa, uh, which is something that exists, and not to say that there are degrees of slavery, uh, because all slavery is morally abhorrent um, and uh, a violation of one's sense of self-ownership and individuality and, and humanity. Um, but drawing a contrast to how the system works elsewhere and how the system works uh, in the United States. Um, but the centerpiece of this chapter, chapter two of uh, interesting life, or interesting narrative of the life of Alada Equiano, is a description of the Middle Passage. And what I want to draw your attention to is the way that Equiano is using point of view to help try to put you and create a sense of empathy by having the version of himself that he's talking about not fully understand what's going on and withholding a lot of those details. What that does is it creates a sense of immediacy where you're seeing the world through the eyes of a child trying to understand what the child is in the process of trying to understand and therefore heightening your level of fear because the child doesn't know. And Equiano holds back on some of the key information. Now, those of us who understand what he's talking about can see through the point of view that he's put on to the narrative and see in the, in the way that, he, you know, uh, he, he could be talking about, he's not sure what this uh, device is. Right? Um, and it has a cap on it and we take it off and then there's a, a, a tip and the tip seems to have ink uh, somehow associated with it. We would know in that moment that what he was talking about was some sort of pen or marker um, uh, in, that could be used. But he's withholding that information and instead describing it enough so that if you know, you know, 
and that otherwise you are put into the perspective of a child who doesn't know and is trying to figure out to create a disorienting effect. To recreate in this moment, then, he's using the form and the style of the text to recreate for his reader what it would be like to be in that moment. He says, starting at the bottom of page 659, of the 10th edition of the Norton Anthology of American Literature, Volume A. I then was a little revived and thought if it were no worse than working, my situation was not so desperate. But still I feared that I should be put to death. The white people looked and acted, as I thought, in so savage a manner, for I had never seen among any people such instances of brutal cruelty. And this not only shown towards us blacks, but also to some of the whites themselves. One white man in particular I saw while we were permitted to be on deck flogged so unmercifully with a large rope near the foremast that he died in consequence of it. And they tossed him over the side as they would have done a brute. This made me fear these people the more and I expected nothing less to be treated in the same manner. I could not help expressing my fears and apprehensions to some of my countrymen. I asked them if these people had no country, but lived in this hallowed place, the ship. They told me they did not, but came from a distant one. Then said I, how comes it in all our country we never heard of them? They told me because they lived so very far off. I then asked, where were their women? Had they any like themselves? I was told they had. And why, said I, do we not see them? They answered, because they were left behind. I asked how the vessel could go. They told me they could not tell, but that there was cloth put upon the masts by the help of the ropes I saw. And then the vessel went on. And the white men had some spell or magic they had put in the water when they liked in order to stop the vessel. I was exceedingly amazed at this account and really thought they were spirits. I therefore wished much to be from amongst them, for I expected they would sacrifice me. But my wishes were vain, for we were so quartered that it was impossible for any of us to make our escape. Uh, the language, the graphic language Equiano uses to discuss the hold of the ship where all of the individuals are placed who are being taken from Africa to slavery is among the most difficult of the passages to read from his text. Um, but I'm gonna read a few sentences that just kind of capture the essence of what Equiano is discussing. This disappointment was the least of my sorrow. The stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time, and some of us had been permitted to stay on the deck for the fresh air. But now that the ship's, whole ship's cargo were confined together, it became absolutely pestilential. The closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. This produced copious perspirations so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells and brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died, thus falling victims to the improvident avarice, as they may call it, of their purchasers. In other words, Equiano is noting here that the greed which is motivating uh, the enslavers to put so many people on the ships is leading to the death of some of the individuals who are being taken to become slaves, that he knows that those who died on the journey of the Middle Passage, you know, deaths, you know, count, counting into the thousands, thousands and thousands of individuals over the length of the slave trade in, in the Atlantic, um, they've fallen victims to the improvident avarice, right? Um, the, the such uh, emotional, primal, animalistic uh, 
greed and cruelty um, that individuals are dying as a result of it um, when the point was for them to arrive alive. Um, so Equiano is pointing out here, of course, one of the many, many instances of the illogic, the illogical um, practices associated with slavery. This wretched situation was again aggravated by the galling of the chains now become un insupportable and the filth of the necessary tubs into which children often fell and were almost suffocated. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered a whole scene of horror almost inconceivable. So we have an effort through language here to describe what in many people would, would just say is an, an indescribable event, right? Um, and a lot of the same tactics are used later to, to write survivor accounts of individuals who endured through the Holocaust, for instance, or other forms of genocide elsewhere in the world. The, the, the large-scale human rights abuses are almost inf in, uh, unfathomable to the human mind unless you're part of it. And that's part of the, um, the purpose here of, of the slave narratives, to try to render into prose uh, the indescribable experiences. At the end of uh, the section that I gave you from Equiano to read, you know, note the way that he engages in um, a reflection here of Christian values and hypocrisy. He writes, O oh, ye nominal Christians, right? Christians in name only, nominal Christians. Might not an African ask you, learned you this from your God who says unto you, do unto all men as you would men should do unto you? Is it not enough that we are torn from our country and friends to toil for your luxury and lust of gain? Must every tender feeling be likewise sacrificed to your avarice? Are the dearest friends and relations now rendered more dear by their separation from their kindred, still to be parted from each other and thus prevented from cheering the gloom of slavery with the small comfort of being together and mingling their sufferings and sorrows? Why are parents to lose their children, brothers their sisters, or husbands their wives? Surely this is a new refinement in cruelty which, while it has no advantage to atone for it, thus aggravates distress and adds fresh horrors even to the wretchedness of slavery. The, the language is often in this sense of uh, asking rhetorical questions that, that can't be answered because first, there is no answer from the voices of the people who are doing the enslaving. And second, because the, the question itself seems to be asking such an existential, such uh, a humanistic perspective that it almost feels like no answer could ever be satisfactory to it. And this is a rhetorical device that we saw on display uh, in William Appice's uh, essay on a, an Indian's uh, perspective, uh, Looking Glass on the White Man. Although Jacob's uh, narrative actually comes last, hers is one of the last major um, uh, slave narratives published. In fact, it's published in 1891, or I'm sorry, 1861, in a way that makes it um, difficult uh, for the, the narrative to gain a lot of traction in its own time because the Civil War has already broken out. Um, I want to talk about Jacob's narrative uh, for a few moments here in reflection of the fact that it captures life in the midst of slavery. So the chronology of thinking about these texts together um, are capturing life in the moment. Jacob's uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl, as I mentioned, is already notable uh, in the sense that what she is experiencing is a reflection of a uh, what it's like to be an enslaved woman. Uh, and most of the narratives that we have are written from the perspective of men. So Jacob's text is incredibly important in that way. Jacob's describes a lot of the struggles that she has associated with uh, 
a life in slavery from the perspective of a woman, such as enduring the sexual harassment and the threats of sexual assault and abuse that come from being a woman in a, 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 in a life where um, one's owner is a man who has a tremendous amount of power over uh, the, the body, which is said to belong to the person who has the body, but in the institution of slavery is in fact uh, owned by someone else. One doesn't even have the right to their own body. And this has raised a difficult uh, moral and ethical questions about what's the right terminology that should accompany um, incidents where uh, one's owner engages in sex with property. Is it properly ter determined to be rape? Can there ever be a system of consent when you don't actually own your body? Uh, and then what should we call it if uh, the dynamics of slavery are in place, but there may be uh, a willingness on the part of the enslaved woman to engage in the relationship, maybe even emotion that comes along with it. This is part of where scholars have really struggled to talk about the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Uh, it's unequivocal that he enslaved her, that she was enslaved by him. Uh, and we know through DNA evidence that they had children together. Um, and so is the word rape the right word to describe the relationship that's there? How is the use of that word made more complicated by the fact that um, Sally Hemings herself uh, uh, may have even chosen um, uh, or developed feelings for Jefferson as a result of that? Um, it's not entirely certain. These are the sticky and uh, ethical philosophical questions that many people are still working through. And I invite you to think about and reflect on yourself. Jacob's narrative really reflects here on the fact that she has uh, uh, developed feelings for someone else, a, a, a man who's black and free, um, and she's unable to engage in a relationship with him because uh, she is uh, uh, enslaved. And that uh, the character here, uh, Dr. Flint, who is the stand-in name for Dr. Norcom, the actual name of the man who enslaved her, just as Linda is used as the stand-in name for Harriet Jacobs and her experiences are uh, uh, re reflecting that. Um, she talks about the, the cruelties and the problems that she had and the feelings of loneliness and desperation. Later in the narrative, this becomes compounded as she starts to have children and fears for the safety of her children as well. There's a reason many scholars believe that uh, many of the people who escaped slavery were men. Um, first, uh, a sense that they were able to leave to try to find a sense of maybe uh, a sense of freedom less held down um, by life uh, on plantation complexes. But another problem is that often uh, women were unable to uh, escape because they were uh, responsible for children that they had born who were enslaved as well and were not able to make uh, a change or um, uh, escape uh, as, uh, as children, the arduous journey associated with escaping. When she finally relents or decides that she's going to um, escape, this is in chapter 10, perilous passage in a slave girl's life, she tells us, I had rather toil on the plantation from dawn till dark. I had rather live and die in jail than drag on from day to day through such a living death. This is a reference to the fact that um, uh, Flint, you know, stand in for Norcom, says he's going to be building the house, uh, and she sees in that the possibility of sexual um, abuse uh, for the rest of, of, of her time. Uh, I was determined that the master whom I so hated and loathed, who had blighted my prospects of my youth and made my life a desert, should not, after my long struggle with him, succeed at last in trampling his victim under his feet. I would do 
anything, everything for the sake of defeating him. What could I do? I thought and thought till I became desperate and made a plunge into the abyss. She talks here about uh, knowing what she had to do in order to get out. And she's cautious with her language here, concealing um, the actions that she had to do in order to find her way out. And uh, at the moment, you know, beseeches uh, women who are reading her narrative, because this is really geared toward a you know, female perspective written for a female audience, to build a sense of sympathy about the experiences of being an enslaved woman and she talks about the feelings as a Christian woman of wanting to remain pure and wanting to be respected and wanting to uh, and, and asking for forgiveness uh, about the actions that she has to take. She asks for pity and for pardoning. Um, but, and she talks about as well, one of her major insights here is that the institution of slavery itself is so morally corrupted, so morally bankrupt, so morally compromised, that there is not a way to endure it, to survive it, to escape it without bending previously established principles of morality, that the institution itself has corrupted all morality so that it's, it's not even possible to talk about uh, observing a moral life within such an immoral institution, right? It's, this, it's the old philosophical problem of, is it considered immoral to steal? Yes. Is it considered immoral to steal when what you're stealing is food to feed starving children? Well, that complicates the situation a little more. And what Jacobs is pointing to is that the contextual experience of a woman in slavery often means choices have to be made deliberately and strategically in order to endure and survive. Actions might be taken that external people might consider to be immoral, but it's part of what's necessary, right? Is it considered um, uh, moral to steal? No. But is it considered immoral to escape from slavery, right? Under a system that views human beings as property to be owned by someone else, escaping slavery is essentially stealing property under the law, right? You're stealing your own body by emancipating yourself and fleeing from the institution of slavery. Uh, but legally, at this time, it would be considered theft and uh, breaking the law to run away from the institution of slavery, right? So it's a, it's a reminder, too, that often what is considered legal is not always moral. What is considered moral is not always legal and the confusion of legality and morality is part of what Jacobs is talking about here. And when she writes, pity me and pardon me, O virtuous reader, you never knew what it is to be a slave, to be entirely unprotected by law and custom, to have the laws reduce you to the condition of a chattel, entirely subject to the will of another. You never exhausted your ingenuity in avoiding the snares and eluding the power of a hated tyrant. You never shuddered at the sound of his footsteps and trembled within hearing of his voice. I know I did wrong. No one can feel it more sensibly than I do. The painful and humiliating memory will haunt me to my dying day. Still, in looking back calmly over the events of my life, I feel that the slave woman ought not to be judged by the same standards as others. The passage from William Wells Brown discusses his escape and his self-education. I want to leave the education part to the side because we'll take a closer look at, uh, in Narrative Life of, the Fr of Frederick Douglass, how Douglass himself acquires literacy. But the important thing here, again, as part of the didactic and the autobiographic elements, reflecting and having introspection as Jacobs is doing in that particular moment, and as we'll see Brown doing in a moment when he talks about the importance of the name, 
The text itself is written in a third-person perspective, save the moment when Brown quotes himself delivering an address. Um, so when I talk about the he's here, you'll have to remember that we're talking about Brown. He uh, describes his uh, escape and uh, the, the difficult conditions that accompany his escape. Um, but again, they, he engages in a, a reflection of the essential values of what it means to be human and the experiences of someone who's enslaved. Uh, on page 911 of, the, of volume B of the Norton Anthology of American Literature, Brown writes, the suffering of the fugitive was greatly increased by the cold, he's talking about himself here, right, from the fact of his having just come from the warm climate of New Orleans. Slaves seldom have more than one name, and William was not an exception to this, and the fugitive began to think of an additional name. The idea of the name is really important. And I think it's maybe important for us to sit and reflect on why the name would be so important, right? The name is part of your personal identity. This is one of the reasons we'll, we'll see this when we look at Douglas's narrative, that he reflects so much on the transformation of his name over time. It seems to accompany this sense of personal journey to become the man who he is going to be. Brown also reflects on this idea. We know that the Wells Brown in his name is indebted to the Quaker man on the, on, the, on the Underground Railroad who provides safety and assistance to him. Much like Equiano, Brown tells his story from a limited point of view and perspective where we're not quite sure whether the characters who promise safety are actually uh, providing safety or whether they are engaged in a larger conspiracy to perhaps punish and re-enslave uh, individuals who are escaping from slavery. We know the fact that Brown is telling the narrative that he has escaped, so we know at least what that outcome is, but all of the details in between the life of slavery and how he comes to write this are left open to us and we're not quite sure what's going to happen. The Quaker who helps him actually does, uh, the Quaker who appears in the narrative actually does help him and we get uh, some narrative here uh, about what he feels as he's taken care of by the man and the woman uh, who help him in his passage. He says, the fact that I was, this is on page 912, the fact that I was in all probability a free man sounded in my ears like a charm. I am satisfied that none but a slave could place such an appreciation upon liberty as I did at that time. I wanted to see my mother and sister, that I might tell them that I was free. I wanted to see my fellow slaves in St. Louis and let them know that the chains were no longer upon my limbs. I wanted to see Captain Price and let him learn from my own lips that I was no more a chattel, but a man. I was anxious too, thus to inform Mrs. Price that she must get another coachman, and I wanted to see Eliza more than I did Mr. Price or Mrs. Price. The fact that I was a free man, could walk, talk, eat, and sleep as a man, and no one to stand over me with the blood clotted cowhide, all this made me feel that I was not myself. But notice this moment of intensity of intense emotional expression is coming in the form of dialogue. This is a third person narrative and Brown is willing to have long passages of almost speeches that are delivered by uh, the, the third person version of himself that, that express those deep, powerful, emotional feelings that he has. Whereas the third person often is used to describe more objectively what is happening in the actions between events. In the exchange that he has with Wells Brown, the Quaker man who's helping him as he's on his journey away from slavery into the North, they get into a discussion about what his name shall be. And, and, and he says, I am not willing to lose my name of William. It was taken from me once against my will, and I am not willing to part with it on any terms. Then, said the benevolent man, I will call thee William Wells Brown. So be it, said William Wells Brown. You know, for the first time, the 
full name in this moment, and he has been known by that name ever since. So the naming of the person is part of the identity. It's not just here that he's looking for a new name. He wants to hold on to his name. He was named William from the start, and then he had that taken away. When the man who was enslaving him uh, invites a nephew uh, to come in, and uh, that nephew is named William, now no longer can the enslaved man be named William. He loses his name. So he wants to cling on to that name, that it's his name. No one can take that from him again. He owns it as much as now he owns his own body. And he adopts the name Wells Brown to complete out his full name, his full identity, in recognition of the man who helps him escape, the man on the Underground Railroad. Um, Brown's narrative then reflects on the journey of the escape and the emerging into a sense of the identity. His narrative ends with a discussion about his journey into literacy. It's a very similar journey to uh, Frederick Douglass. In fact, we get told in a, in a footnote at the start of the narrative that uh, new material was added that was somewhat similar to Frederick Douglass's. Uh, Douglass's narrative comes out in 1845 and this one comes out in 1853. Um, so, although uh, Brown's experience of learning to uh, read and write is, uh, is important to his own personal journey, it's also similar to Douglas's. So let's hold on to that and save that discussion for Douglas's. In the next lecture, we will take a very close and deep dive into the entirety of Douglas's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and so I hope we'll continue to talk about the characteristics of the slave narrative genre, and we'll continue to talk about Douglas's use of literary language, figurative language, and rhetoric to achieve his ends of indicting the institution of slavery while telling his own personal